Apparently, some of those people heard the initial explosion. They had time to look up and see the whole top of that mountain simply disintegrating there. And then there were the rivers of living death flowing swiftly down the side of the mountain. And they had time to turn and start running. But before they could escape, they were overtaken by it and buried there to be dug up by later generations. Yes, what will it be? When, when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 A.D., an entire city was wiped out of existence. Today, Amazing Facts speaker Joe Cruz talks about Pompeii and its final fling before it disappeared under the ashes. His crusade title, The Last Night on Earth. I'd like to introduce our study today by reading a text from the Old Testament in Ezekiel 7, verses 5 to 7. Now, I'm going to deviate a little bit from my normal practice here and read this verse or these verses from the Weymouth's trans or Moffitt's translation of the Bible. It says, Evil on evil, says the Lord, the Eternal. It is coming. The hour has come. The hour is striking and striking at you. The hour and the end... Your doom has come. Now, friends, today I have a message for every individual. Somehow I wish everybody in North America could hear the words that I have to say today. I'm going to talk about the last night on earth. And that must finally come to every person, every individual who's ever lived in this world. It will come at last. I know many of you have heard about the city of Pompeii, which nestled in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius in old Italy long ago. It was in the year 79 A.D. that that mountain simply exploded with volcanic fury. Millions of tons of molten lava came pouring down the sides of that mountain to completely inundate that city, destroying most of the population of it. A friend of mine has actually visited the old ruins of Pompeii. He has walked over the hardened lava streets that still remain there. And he saw the forms of people who had been dug up out from under that hardened lava. You see, their bodies had been buried there, covered up there, and then they had decayed and deteriorated and left the actual form of their body inside that hardened lava. And then when they dug it up, they put in plaster of Paris and actually came forth with the exact stance and posture of those people as they were fleeing from that flaming holocaust. I've often thought, friends, if the stones of the street could speak... What a story they would have to tell us about that last night on earth for Pompeii. The whole thing seems to come up before me as I think about it today. The experience of a city full of people who are suddenly overtaken and cut down in their tracks, whether they're ready or not, thrust into eternity. Oh, what will it be when you and I come to that last night on earth? Apparently, some of those people heard the initial explosion. They had time to look up and see the whole top of that mountain simply disintegrating there. And then there were the rivers of living death flowing swiftly down the side of the mountain, and they had time to turn and start running. But before they could escape, they were overtaken by it and buried there to be dug up by later generations. Yes, what will it be when you and I come to that last night on earth, friends? I've often thought about the Apostle Paul and what kind of experience he must have had when he went to preach in Pompeii. Now, I'm sure he did it, even though that was a wicked city. Listen, Pompeii had a reputation. It was a wild place. It was wicked. The inhabitants of that place were a, a licentious, immoral, dissipated people. They just lived for having a good time, and yet I don't believe that would have deterred Paul. I think he went there to proclaim his gospel of grace regardless of anything else. But I just wonder, friends, how they received him. I, wondered, I wonder what happened there when he proclaimed his message. I somehow think they probably drove him out of town, maybe rode him out of town on a rail. And maybe Paul had to shake the dust off his feet as he left that city to its damnation because it was such a very, very wicked place. You see, it was just nine years earlier that General Titus had come here and drawn many of his soldiers out of the city of Pompeii, and then he marched over against Jerusalem. And it might have been one of those citizens of Pompeii that threw that flaming torch into the beautiful temple, burning it down to the ground. 
And now these veterans of foreign wars have come back home to retire here in this wicked, dissolute city of Pompeii. And they're living out their years of retirement there amidst all of the dancing and drinking and merrymaking that characterized the life of this particular city. Oh, friends, what was it like? What was it like on that last night of Pompeii? Maybe they were having a big party. And there was a lot of laughing and and shouting and drinking and sin going on, no doubt about that. And then maybe the people went to their beds. But believe me, the Spirit of God must have been working in a very mighty way that night. It was the last call of God to that doomed city. And the people's consciences were being pricked by the Spirit of God. They were tossing on their beds. They were very uncomfortable because of the convictions of sin that were being brought to them by the last call of mercy from God to that city. But then I can just imagine that slowly, one after another, they sort of drowned out the voice of the Spirit, and, and, and the doom of the city was, was sealed, friends. You know, the Bible has another very interesting story of the last night on earth. It's in the 19th chapter of Genesis. Let's turn there and look at it, because it's a very interesting account. Genesis 19, In verse 14, it says, Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters. Now, these girls had married local fellows, and and of course, they were uh, typical of the inhabitants of that city. It was a terrible place, sex, degenerate, and everything else. And so he came to those sons-in-law, it said, which married his daughters, and he said, "Ah, Get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Isn't that interesting? They laughed at the fears of this old man. They said, don't worry about us. We're all right. And they scoffed, thinking he had probably gotten a little bit senile in his head. Now, friends, let me ask you something. Suppose that these young men had believed what Lot had to say. Suppose they had known that this was a true message and that this thing was really going to happen that the angel messengers had said. I'll tell you one thing. The story in the Bible would be a lot different than it is, wouldn't it? I mean, they would have left that place and they would have gotten out fast if they had only believed that he was telling the truth and that this thing was really going to happen. But they didn't believe, you see, and so they were left there to perish alone. Now, I can say the same thing about anybody listening to my voice today. If you knew exactly what was going to be happening in the future, even a week in advance or a month in advance or a year in advance, for example, suppose you knew you only had one year to live or maybe even one month to live, or a week to live, or a day to live. You say, Brother Joe, I can make any preparation necessary. I could get ready for that. I could make things right with people that I needed to make right. And I could confess my sins. I could prepare myself and be ready, even if death was going to come, if I only knew that I had that day, that week, that month, that year. Of course we could, but do you know something? Most of us will never know when we begin to live that last 24 hours of our lives. We will not know that, friends. We may not even have the slightest idea that it will be coming. It might come tomorrow. It might come the next day. It may be next week. It could be a month. We don't know. But if we did know, of course we could make things right. We could confess our sins. We could arrange our affairs and our business, but we won't know, and the devil knows that. And he takes advantage of that fact And my friends, his great program today is to make people keep on waiting, believing that they've got more time, they've got another day, they've got another month, another year, and so forth. And so this sin of neglect usually turns into the sin of rejection. It really does. I mean, the Bible has some dramatic illustrations about this. And by the way, almost every one of us must come to a time in our lives someday And maybe it's already happened to you. I can tell you it's already happened to me. I can remember when I had a decision to make. And the choice that I made at that time, at that moment, was going to affect my entire future. In fact, friends, it would affect not only the direction my life would take in this world, but it would even affect my eternal destiny. And I had to make it within five minutes. And perhaps you've had the same thing happen to you. Have you indeed where you had a choice to make, you had a decision to make, and you knew that it had to be done immediately? And the result of that choice could reach right on past this world into eternity. 
Sometimes it happens. I think about Paul. As he stood there in front of that governor, you remember, and in front of that king, he talked to Felix, he talked to Agrippa. One of them said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. The other one said, Paul, go thy way for now, and when I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. Well, friends, these convenient moments don't come back again very often, do they? You see, the golden opportunity presents itself usually for us. The Spirit of God pleads with our heart at a certain time in a certain situation, and we have the choice to make. The door opens up for us. We can move into that open door or we can refuse it. But oh, how many people keep on waiting, believing that they'll have another opportunity. There'll be a better time and a chance for them to say yes to God a little bit later. But friends, that doesn't come very often. It really doesn't come very often. Oh, I've had meetings over and over again in places where, where, where people came uh, uh, the next year and the next year. In one city of the United States, I've had five one-month evangelistic crusades in that one city. And it stretched out over a period of, of 20 years. But I would go back every three or four years, every five years, I'd have another evangelistic series, and the same men would come by me at the door saying exactly the same thing they said three years ago and then three years before that. And here's what they say. They say, oh, Brother Joe, that's really beautiful. I believe everything you've been preaching. It is so logical. It is so clear. It is so true. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to make arrangements. And I'll be doing that. You just wait. I'll let you know. Someday I'm going to do that. And then I go back three years later. And there they are coming by me saying the same thing. And they really, truly believe that they can do it anytime they want to. But I've told you before, on this program, friends, that we cannot make a decision for Christ anytime we want to. We can only make a decision for Christ when the Holy Spirit is calling us. And when that door is open in front of us, when that door closes for people every day all across this land, thousands and thousands of people are having their last opportunity and their final invitation. So don't think that you can keep waiting. Those men who say that to me in those places, really, they do not realize that they're not capable of making that decision anymore. They can talk about it, but that's all they can do. Their will has already been paralyzed by indecision, and they've waited so long now that their conscience is seared and hard. And they'll be waiting, my friends, when the water turns to blood. Oh, there are multitudes of people who've already waited so long that their convictions now are not strong enough to really prompt them to repent. And to really turn to God sincerely, it would all be just a sham or a make-believe. It's sort of like Satan who's going to bow at last and confess that Jesus is God. But it'll be too late, and he won't be bowing that knee in repentance or sincerity. And so there are people who are waiting, and someday, oh yes, they're going to seek for truth, and they're going to try to enter in. They'll go from the east to the west and the north to the south. But Jesus said they'll not be able to enter in. Never be able to enter in. Oh, friends, it's only when the door is open that we can move. I think about that ark. You remember Noah and the flood and the ark? And how that great man of God, that preacher of righteousness, proclaimed his message for 120 years. And those people crowded around and they listened to him and they believed the message. A lot of them believed it. A lot of them were his own relatives. And he told them what was going to happen. He said, the flood's coming. This place is going to be destroyed. The whole earth is going to be destroyed. This is the only way for you to escape. You must come into this ark of safety. But you know, friends, when that door closed, there were only eight people inside. You remember? Only eight people responded and went inside. And the rest, you know what the rest of them were doing? I believe that they were crowding in there around the door and they were watching and they were listening. They'd been greatly impressed by all of these animals going in two by two and seven by seven. And then they watched as, as finally, 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 that door was closed with an unseen hand, and that was it. They were all shut up inside. And there were many of those people. Listen, there were many of those people just one step on the outside of that ark. One step only. All they needed to do was just move in one step, and it would put them inside. But there they were on the threshold, on the outside, when that door closed. Now, that closed door for seven days before the flood came represents the seven last plagues, friends, that will come upon this earth. And probation will have closed for the earth during the seven last plagues. It will be poured out. Just like the probation of this world was closed and sealed when that door shut. 
Still seven days before the destruction came, but there was no more opportunity, you see. That was it. The final call had been made. The last decision had been made. And so it will be for the inhabitants of this earth. They will not be able to make any decision when the plagues begin to fall, friends. And when the door of opportunity closes, and that might come in any individual life at any time, this heart can stop beating. The door can shut in your life in a moment of time. You may not be here tomorrow. You may not have the opportunity later than today. But now we do have the opportunity. And so the door can shut. I've been having evangelistic meetings. I, I've had people fall over right in the audience with a heart attack, die right there while they're listening to the message. It's happened as they walk out of the building. In Baltimore, Maryland, evangelistic meeting, an amazing facts crusade was being held. The man had been there every night. He was planning to be baptized at the end of that crusade. And that night he received, uh, as a little token of his faithfulness in coming to the meeting, a beautiful picture of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And as he walked away from the meeting that night with his little grandson with him, going down to deliver his little grandson to the home, he left him off, and then he started walking the two blocks to his own home. And as he walked, in the darkness, suddenly shots rang out. And bullets came through the picture the man was holding in his hand, right through the picture of Jesus, right into the man's heart. He dropped dead there. He wasn't able to be baptized that Sabbath. But, oh, friends, I could tell you over and over again of things that happen. Because the door is open. The golden moment comes, and we need to move in. And if we don't move in, my friends, we never know when God is going to shut the door and when He'll allow us another opportunity. We can't say. We have no control of those things as to when another call of God will come. I think about the children of Israel. You know, they were coming up out of Egypt. And there they were at the Red Sea place. Remember that? And, and, and here they were trapped. I mean, the armored chariots of Egypt were coming from behind them. On either side were those mountains. In front of them was the water of the Red Sea. They had nowhere to go. They were trapped and they knew it. And then you remember what happened. God spoke through Moses and said to the people, Go forward. Go forward. How can you go forward into the water, friends? There was nothing but deep water out there in front of them. But God said, Do it. Now, I'm glad that somebody didn't say, Well, look, let's not do that. That's rash. Let's have a committee meeting. Let's talk about this. There must be some other way. You know, there was no bridge. There was no pontoon bridge or boats or anything to get them out of there. There was nothing but just the deep water in front of them. But God said, go ahead and move, act, start walking. Well, I'm glad somebody up in the front had a little faith, aren't you? Somebody started walking. It looked like a crazy thing to do, but if God says it, well, to do it, shouldn't we? Even if we don't understand all of the results or the consequences of it. And so these people started walking, they moved out, and then suddenly that water separated. And here was a plain, dry path across that sea. Now, friends, do you know what the Red Sea represents as far as you and I are concerned? You know what it represents? Come with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1, 2, and 3. Listen. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses and the cloud and the sea. What does that represent for us? Baptism. You see that? Well, the Bible says they were all baptized in the Red Sea. That's the baptismal, uh, baptism place, friends. You see, there's a beautiful parallel between what happened to ancient Israel and what's happening to us as modern Israel. They came up out of the bondage of Egypt. We come out of the bondage of sin. Those things are parallel. And they came to the Red Sea. Well, bless your heart, friends, that represents baptism for us. Going through that wilderness represents our going through the darkness of this earth. Coming into Canaan represents our coming into the heavenly Canaan. There's a, there's a parallel. And so the Red Sea place is a baptism place. You see, you've just been delivered from all of those enemies of bad habit and sin. And now the next step for you to take is the step of faith in baptism. Well, now, suppose you don't go forward, friends. Let me ask you something. What would have happened to those people of Israel if they had not moved out? You know what would have happened as well as I do. The armies of Egypt would have been upon them. They would have been captured and taken back into bondage again. And this is exactly what happens to people who hesitate there at the Red Sea place of baptism in their lives. 
They also are going to be captured again by those enemies, those habits of sin from which they have now secured a deliverance, and they'll be taken back into bondage again. I've seen it happen over and over again. I could tell you stories of that. One woman who came to our evangelistic meetings made a decision for baptism. God had delivered her from drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and, and now the next step for her was baptism. But do you know something, friends? She was fearful of that. Her faith was very weak on that point, and four times, no, three times, three times her, her baptismal date was set, and she never showed up either time. And I don't have to tell you probably what happened to that woman. I can tell you right now that she drifted back into the bondage of her sins and her past life. The enemy came upon her and took her back because there she was. Now, that next move was hers. And there comes a time, my friends, when God can't do anything for us until we do something. And we have to begin acting before God can honor our faith and do anything in our behalf to help us or deliver us. And so the step that lies before us now is the step of baptism. And we must move out there in faith. Now, you may not see all the results of it. Some of you are saying, Brother Joe, if I did that, why, look at my family, look at my friends. What, do you, what would they think? What would they say? And, and, and what about my job? And what about this and that? Oh, friends, we can have all kinds of fears. But those fears are unfounded when you think about the one who's leading us. God is going to open up that Red Sea for us just as surely as he opened it up for the children of Israel. Don't you believe that? Of course he will open up that sea. Let's have faith. Let's go forward, my friends, in faith as God leads us and as he speaks to us and guides us in doing it. We must have faith. Sometimes people say to me, well, Brother Joe, why is it that so few people, so few people are really doing anything about it? You know, it's easy to preach the message. It's easy to convince people about what's right, but very few people are willing to really act upon it. And, and really, those people are worse than they were if they didn't know because faith without works is dead. And, of course, that's right. That is right. Now, why is it, friends, that there are so few? Why did so few go into the ark? Have you ever thought about that? Out of all the inhabitants of the earth at that time, there were just eight people who had the faith and the courage or love or whatever you want to call it to go into that ark with Noah. Why not? What about his own relatives who helped build the, the boat? I'm sure that there were a lot of his friends and even his close relatives there probably that helped to hammer those nails and to build that big boat as it was constructed on the side of the dry hill. Why didn't they go into the ark, friends? Well, the answer to that is the very same answer as to the question today, why don't more people obey the truth? I think that they were just as convinced in Noah's day as they're convinced when we preach the message of truth today. But knowing it is not good enough, Believing it is not good enough, friends. God is never going to say, Well said, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. He's not going to say, Well believed, thou good and faithful servant, is he? He's going to say, Well done. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. God's calling for people who have enough love for him. Not to just sit back and say, Nice, beautiful, fine. God's looking for people who will have the courage, my friends, to step out and obey him. Obey him. That's what we need to do. We really need that more than anything else. Obey God. Now, I want to try to answer the question today as to, as to why so few people will be saved. Why so few people will really accept the message of truth and enter into that ark. You know, of course, what our Lord said. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. You have been listening to the first part of a series by Joe Cruz on The Last Night on Earth. The day is coming, friend. Are you ready? We pray that Joe's powerful message has stirred you to get ready if you aren't right now. We'd like to help in that decision if we can by sending a free copy of his message today. I'll give the address in a moment, but let's listen first to the messengers sing... The story of Jesus will never grow old. The story of Jesus will never grow old. Grow old. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story. Sweetest that ever was heard. 
But Sadiq was a man whom I met in 1956 in the city of Lahore, Pakistan. I was living there at the time as a missionary. I'll never forget it. It was on Christmas Day. And on that day, a knock came at my door. I opened the door, and this Muslim man, at least he seemed to be dressed in the common garb of the ordinary Muslim man, he rushed past me into my house, and he said, Quick, 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 quick. He said, Baptize me. Baptize me right now. Today, Amazing Facts speaker Joe Cruz tells the thrilling story of a Muslim man who gave up everything he had to become a Christian. Stay tuned for his concluding message in the two-part series entitled, The Last Night on Earth. Now, I want to try to answer the question today as to, as to why so few people will be saved, why so few people will really accept the message of truth and enter into that ark. You know, of course, what our Lord said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. All right. Jesus said, just like it was back there, we can expect it to be again. Only eight people went in then. That means that only a very small proportionate number of people at the end of time will enter into the ark of safety and be saved. Very few. Jesus said, narrows the way and straight is the gate that leadeth to life. And few there be that find it. But why, friends? Why? The same excuses are given today. The very same things are being used. Now, the Bible says that the very imagination of their heart was evil continually. Those people had sort of deadened themselves by participation in the world of sin and the world of the flesh. And as they continued on in willful transgression, violating their conscience, sinning against the light of truth that God was bringing them through that great preacher of righteousness, 
why this thing was happening. And their consciences finally became pretty seared. And, of course, they had friends back there just like people have friends today. And the friend said, oh, don't, don't, don't worry about that. That old man down there, he doesn't know what he's talking about. The world's not going to come to an end. We've got plenty of time. Forget it. Enjoy yourself. Have a good time. Don't be so fearful of what that man is saying. Now, friends, I can tell you that the same words are being spoken today to people, aren't they? Friends, relatives, children, parents are comforting one another and saying, don't worry about those things. Don't worry about the coming of Jesus. Don't worry about the law of God. Don't worry about the Sabbath. Don't worry about keeping any of those commandments. We don't have to do that. Everything's all right. And so they go on and on doing that. My friends, today God is calling for people to step out in faith and exercise a little faith. But not many are going to do it. Not very many. Why? Because it requires sacrifice. That's why. We're living in a soft, materialistic world today when people don't like to make any kind of sacrifice or self-denial. Let's face it. You know, most people are not looking for the truth today. You know what they're looking for? They're looking for a smooth, easy, comfortable, convenient religion that will allow them to do anything they want to do and still believe that they can be saved at last. Now, let me tell you something, my friends. There is no religion like that, no true religion like that, is there? There's no true religion that allows you to live the way you want to live and have everything you want to have. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It costs something to be a real Christian. It really does. Jesus said, Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And he said all. He meant all, friends. And we've got to be willing to give up anything. I don't care what it is. Friends, family. Jesus said, If you love your family more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. If you love your job more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. If you love your church more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. No, friends. You've got to be willing to give up everything for Christ. And I'm telling you that in this very affluent, materialistic age of ours, we don't find very many Christians with a moral backbone and courage and fortitude to serve God. We really don't. People are not willing to change their lifestyle or give up anything for God. And yet, we've got to be willing to, friends. But this is the reason Jesus said, Narrow is a way and straight is a gate, and few there be that find it. This is the reason, he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Why? Because they're not willing to change. They're not willing to forsake their sins. They're not willing to give up the things that are standing in their way that they're making gods out of that is keeping them from serving God and keeping all of His commandments. And because they're not willing to give up those things, they'll be lost. They'll be lost. Now, I've heard people say, well, Brother Joe, you know, if I... If I had been back there in the days of Noah, I would have gone into that ark. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever heard anybody say that? Oh, would you? Would you have gone into the ark, friends? Would you have been willing to risk the ridicule and the laughter? I mean, what about today? Are you willing to be ridiculed and laughed at today? Some people won't do that. They will never do anything that's going to bring embarrassment to them or bring any kind of ridicule on them. Well, if you had been in the days of Noah, my friends, and had gone on the ark, you would have been laughed at and mocked at and ridiculed. And I'm telling you right now, if you're going to follow Jesus all the way, you get ready because you're going to meet it now. And if you don't meet any ridicule and if nobody makes fun of you and if you're not embarrassed by stepping out in the truth because of the way people are going to mock and laugh at what you're doing, then, my friends, you're, you don't love Jesus supremely. Don't worry about what people say and think. You and I ought to be concerned about just one thing. What does God think? What is going to please Him? We're not living in this world to please our friends or to please organizations or to please any man. We're living here, my friends, for one purpose, and that is to please our Lord Jesus Christ. I've had people say, well, if I'd been back there in the days of the martyrs, I would have been one of the martyrs. <laughs> would you have been one of the martyrs? Millions of people died during those dark ages. You know what happened. And every one of them could have saved themselves by just one thing. Do you know how they could have saved themselves? Let me explain, friends, how that could have been. 
You could have saved yourself had you been living back there by going up in front of an idol and putting a little pinch of incense. You see, those people were brought to this place where there was an idol and a place for incense, and here was the stake over here. And you would have been told, now, if you go up there and offer that incense to the idol, you're home free. You can go home to your family. But if you don't, there's the stake waiting for you. And do you know that millions of people were willing to die rather than break one of the commandments of God? Can you, you say you would have been one of them? You would have been one of them? Maybe you would. But I'll tell you something, unless you would rather die today rather than break God's commandment, you wouldn't have been one of those martyrs then, would you? You would not. You would not. Oh, it wasn't very easy to be a martyr, my friends. No, no. And all you need to do is just go up there and put a little incense. And you might have said, well, I'm just going to pretend to do it. I'm not really going to do it. God knows that I'm not worshiping that idol. I'm just going to go through the motions of it. Doesn't matter, my friends. It would have been an act of disloyalty to God. Those people weren't willing to do that. They died rather than do that. Now, they weren't worrying about losing a little money, were they? They weren't worrying about losing a few friends, were they? They weren't worrying about their job and whether they're going to lose their job. Their lives were on the line. But they said, that's all right. I'm going to die before I break God's law. How many people do you find today that have that kind of moral courage, friends? How many people? This is why Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it'll be in the days of the Son of Man. People don't have that kind of martyr faith today. People today aren't willing to give up a few dollars, let alone their lives. They're not willing to sacrifice a few friends, let alone their lives. They're not willing to give up their job, let alone their lives. Oh, no, friends. People today are weak, spineless, no courage, no faith compared to what those martyrs were. Listen, there are some martyrs around still. Don't misunderstand me. And I'd like to tell you about one of them. You may have read about Sodic in my book, called Reigns on My Life. But Sadiq was a man whom I met in 1956 in the city of Lahore, Pakistan. I was living there at the time as a missionary. I'll never forget it was on Christmas Day. And on that day, a knock came at my door. I opened the door, and this Muslim man, at least he seemed to be dressed in the common garb of the ordinary Muslim man, he rushed past me into my house, and he said, quick, 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 quick. He said, baptize me, baptize me right now. Well, I calmed him down, and he began to talk and to tell me who he was and why he was saying these words. I found out that Sadiq was from the tribal areas of Pakistan, way up there near the Khyber Pass. In fact, he lived right in the Khyber Pass area, near the borders of Afghanistan. And that's an area that is, that is ruled by Muslim law. There is no government control up there. And when I traveled up there myself, they sent an armed guard along with me because they could not guarantee safety. Up there, every man carried a gun or a knife or an axe, and they took the law into their own hands. And so this man was from that area, and, uh, and he told me what had happened up in that area. You see, a colleague of mine had been up there holding evangelistic meetings, and he had a tent there. And every night, this Muslim man would travel from his work home, and he'd pass right by that tent. He didn't dare go inside, of course, because his life would have been endangered immediately. But he stood out in the shadows of the trees. And he listened to the message night after night after night. And when the calls and the invitations were given, he didn't move forward like a lot of people because he didn't dare. He stood outside with tears streaming down his cheeks. And he went home that night and he said to his wife, Listen, I'm going to be a Christian. I've been listening to those messages and I know it's right and I'm going to become a Christian. Well, my friends, the next day when he came home from his fine government job, he found his house empty. His wife and children had been taken away by his father-in-law. He was never to see them again. And then, the next day after that, he lost his job with the government because his relatives went to the government and intervened against him. He was now an infidel, and so there was no job for him any longer in the government. A few days after that, he was waylaid by his own relatives and beaten almost to death. He was left for dead, unconscious in the gutter. When he recovered his consciousness, he fled for his life and came down to the teeming city of Lahore, Pakistan. He had found out where this evangelist lived, and here he was now in my living room begging me, please baptize me now. 
And my friends, we filled the baptistry, and we baptized Sodic that day. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. As he came up out of the water, the scars on his face that I looked at, he'll carry them the rest of his life. He'll be a refugee for the rest of his life. If his family ever finds him, they'll kill him. And so he must hide out from his own relatives, his own family, and flee always for his life from place to place in order to live, never see his children again. He had given up everything he had, really. He was a member of my church there. I'll never forget. He came to me one day and he said, Please, Pastor, go and talk to the mission board and have them send me over into Afghanistan. He said, I want to go as a peddler and seller of cloth, and I'll give out copies of the Bible as I go, and I'll spread the message. And I said, no, Sadiq, if you went there, you wouldn't live 24 hours. They don't even allow a Christian to come in there and, and speak of, of Christ or Christianity. They'd kill you. You wouldn't live 24 hours. He said, that doesn't matter. He said, I want to go, please. He said, ask them to let me go. Here was a man who'd get, given up everything he had. He'd, he'd lost his family. He lost his home. He lost his job. He almost lost his life. And now he's saying, let me go. I want to go there. My friends, do you know what it is to sacrifice? What are you giving up for Christ? What are you giving up for Christ? There are some, my friends, in this city who won't even give up a friend or a dollar or, or a few trifling worldly things. I've had people tell me, well, look, I can't, I can't change my way of dressing. I can't give up these, these worldly things. I can't give up my, my, my pork and my shrimp. And st oh, friends, listen, what, what do we think? What kind of a religion are we looking for? Are we looking for a cheap religion that doesn't require anything? If we don't, if it doesn't cost us anything, it's not worth anything, my friends. It's not worth anything. We've got to be willing to give up everything. We must be willing to give up everything. And I appeal to you to make that decision to go all the way with Jesus. Don't be afraid of that. Some people say, well, Brother Joe, if I'd lived back in the days of Jesus, I would have been one of his disciples. Would you have been one of them? Do you know what it meant back there to really follow Jesus? You were thrown out of the synagogue. Do you know what that involved? That meant that you were disinherited from your family. You were boycotted in your business. You were actually counted as though you were dead. Your own friends considered that you had died, the funeral had been held, and you were gone. They wouldn't even acknowledge your presence. They really wouldn't. That's what it meant to be cast out of the synagogue. You say you would have been a follower of Jesus back there? Maybe, maybe. If now you're willing to suffer anything for him, then you would have been a disciple maybe. If you'd be willing to give up anything, your friends, your job, your church, anything at all that comes between you and God and obedience to him, then, of course, you would have been a disciple of Jesus back there because that's what it cost them. It cost them their, their church, their family, their home, and their business. And we've got to be willing to give up any of those things, my friends, or even all of them if it's necessary. We've got to give up everything to follow him. You come back there to the days of Noah. What about, what about Noah's day? Was it easy then? Did it sound very logical or convincing to be talking about a flood, my friends? Do you know what the world was like in those days? Listen, they'd never even seen any rain come down out of the heavens, had they? The whole earth was watered by a mist that came up from the face of it, we're told. And those antediluvians had never seen it rain in their whole lifetime. Now, it might not be hard to convince people today that there might be a flood, especially if you go through one of these rainy seasons, as so many places are doing these days. But listen, friends, if you had never seen rain in your life, it would be pretty hard to convince you that a flood was going to come and wash everything away and destroy every bit of life. It really would. And that was the situation back in the days of Noah. And he proclaimed that message right up on the, at the dry side of a hill where it had never rained. He was building a boat of all things. There wasn't any water Within, I suppose, hundreds of miles, we don't know. But anyway, it, it wasn't going to rain. Everybody knew that. And yet for 120 years, the message rang out from that boat side. 
that it was coming, it was coming, it was coming, and the people listened to it, and they got gospel-hardened just like they do today as they heard it over and over again. And then, of course, the last day came. And Noah, bless his heart, had put away his tools now. It was all finished. His friends had helped him. His relatives had helped him. And now it was done. And he stood up there to talk to them, to preach to them, to invite them for the very last time. Can you imagine what that dramatic scene must have been like, friends? Listen, I've thought about it many times. And if I could go back in history, if I could move back through the years and listen to just one sermon that's ever been preached on this planet Earth, I think it would have to be that last sermon of Noah. Wouldn't you? I'd love to have been there to hear what he said to those people. Oh, I've imagined. I've, I've tried to go back in my mind to what it was like as he stood there knowing that this was it now. He was going to give his last invitation after 120 years. Oh, I know what it is to give a final invitation after a month. But I don't know what it's like to give a final invitation after 120 years of preaching. That was a long crusade. It really was. But there he stood now, and he preached to those people, and he appealed to them to make their decision, and he looked down into the faces of those people, his own friends, his own relatives. Many of them had been co-workers with him there, no doubt, in helping to build the ark. And he pleaded with them. He said, friends, it's coming. It's coming. This is the last call now. This is the final invitation. You've got to come in. It's your only hope. Don't let anything hold you back. Come on. Come into the ark with me. You saw the animals go in. You know that God's been working in this. And my friends, I can just imagine the deep stirring of the Spirit of God on the hearts of those people. Can't you? Oh, I think that there were people out in that audience that day who were stirred so deeply with conviction by the earnest words of that preacher that they started moving. I can see a wife over here, and she begins to work her way through the crowd to go forward, and her husband reaches out and pulls her back. I can see a young person over here begin to move forward, and the parents reach out and pull him back. And people whisper to each other, and they're stirred with conviction. But that's all there was. Noah kept on talking, kept on pleading. And then I can see the old man as he turns weeping and he walks through the door of that ark and then he comes back again and he stands there and makes a final call. And once more, the people move uneasily in their places because they believe what he's saying. They're stirred by what he's saying. But then finally, poor Noah has to turn and, and with tears on his leathery cheeks, he walks back through the door of the ark, and then an unseen hand closes that door. And I can see the people as they stand out there talking, and, and one says to the other, my, have you ever heard anything like that? Wasn't that something? Do you think he really was telling the truth? Do you think there really will be a flood? And then the people began to sort of scatter. And then they went to their homes, and it was a very uneasy time. And maybe for a day or two, they were still very, very uncomfortable and under conviction. But then the days passed by, five days, six days, seven days went by, and there he was all locked up in that thing, and the people were walking by, and now their attitude was changing. And they were saying, oh my, I'm glad I didn't go in. Look, they're all locked up in that hot old boat, and, and nothing's going to happen. Poor, poor uh, Noah, he, he's going to be so embarrassed when he has to come out. But then, my friends, right there on that seventh day, suddenly there was a tremendous roar of thunder, and then the heavens opened up, and the very fountains of the deep, it says, were broken up, and the water began to come from everywhere. And people began to run, to get away, running to the highest mountains they could find and climbing the highest trees they could find. But then one after another, they were carried down into the murky depths by the waters, and, and then there was just a boat. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. My friends, God's message is sounding today. People are under conviction about the message and the truth, just like they, just like they were back then. And they sit and they believe it. They know it's right. But how do you get them to move, friends? How do you get them to move? I know how Noah felt. I can't, I can't understand the depth of his feelings because I don't have a whole world listening to me, friends. But I have 500 people 
or a thousand people or five thousand people sometimes. And I know exactly what's going on in the hearts of those people. A tremendous struggle is going on just like it did in the lives of the Antediluvians. People believe in it. They tell me, yes, I believe it, but I'm not ready to do it yet. I'll do it later. Someday I'll do it. Oh, my friends, suppose they'd say, that's what they said to Noah. That's what they said to him on the last day. Oh, yeah, you know, someday, someday. But then the door shut, and that was it. Oh, my friends, here we are, the last day of the crusade, the last message of the crusade. And some of you have not made a decision yet. I don't know why. I don't understand why. You believe it. You know it's right. And yet somehow you're being held back. People are holding you back. Friends are holding you back. Churches maybe are even holding you back, telling you that you should not obey all the commandments of God. My friends, God is calling for you today to make that decision. Please don't hesitate to step out for Him. Make your decision today, friends. Make your decision today. It's my Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in Eden. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what 
went wrong. Available now on DVD. Strange as it may seem, 86% of the products that are on sale at the corner drugstore were not even in existence 15 years ago. I'll be back in a moment with the amazing facts about the mirage of materialism. Hello, this is Joe Cruz on the Amazing Facts broadcast, facts which affect you. She was a beautiful woman, and it was a beautiful park. There was just one thing unusual about the whole situation, and that was that she was standing there talking to a snake. She had no idea of the significance of this interview, but he did. This was the initial skirmish and the greatest controversy the universe has ever known. She listened to his arguments, and he deceived her. That moment of sin cost her everything. Since that time, Satan's steady attempt has been to lead astray and lead captive the mind of man. You see, friends, your mind is the only thing that separates you from the animals. A dog has a stomach, a cow has a heart, but only man has a mind that's rational, that can reason and think from cause to effect. Our minds are the only access that you and I have to God. For that reason, since the entrance of sin into this world, Satan has tried to lead astray and lead captive the mind of man. For a man to be able to withstand the attacks of the devil, for a man to be able to discern the fine line that sometimes lies between truth and error, and for a man to be able to know the difference between that which is acceptable Christian conduct and that which is sin, he must have all his mental faculties with him. You remember in his greatest crisis hour, Jesus was attacked in this very area. In fact, you'll also remember that they wanted to give him vinegar mingled with myrrh to dull his pain and uh, his senses, but he refused it on the cross. Satan's steadied attempts, I say, have been to twist the thinking of men's minds so that they can't see the issues clearly. And I believe that he has reserved a whole host of these deceptions for the last days. The devil has descended on our generation with a barrage of them, the likes of which history has never known before. And I'd like to share with you today and in the next few days what I consider to be five of his most devilish and insidious and successful snares. Listen to this text in Matthew 19, 16 to 20. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What like I yet? Now, friends, notice Christ's answer to this young man in verse 21. Jesus said, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
Now, that isn't exactly the way the last phrase reads, and yet it could read that way, because here was a young man with dollar signs in his eyes, and I have no doubt but that he had the fastest hot rod chariot in town. Probably a beautiful home and servants and a fresh water swimming pool in the backyard. I don't know, but it does say that he had great possessions. However, he turned on his heel and walked away, and you don't read about him again anywhere in the pages of the Word of God. Now, friends, in the judgment day, when that young man looks at what he could have had, all those things in his personal inventory are going to turn to ashes in his mouth. Jesus fought this problem way back there in the times we're talking about today. And this is number one of the great deceptions of the devil in our day, and that's materialism. The rich young ruler didn't know the half of it. Do you realize that 86% of the products that are on sale in the corner drugstore were not even in existence 15 years ago? 86%. There's never been a generation that's been deluged with so many things as our generation. I read about a sign, or I read about a sign on a bank the other day that said, The Jones borrow here. The devil wants us to try to have more things than the other man or our neighbors down the street. And he started a very graphic program to get us to do that. Uh, you know, there was a picture in a magazine the other day of a model home, and in that home was a model family, father, mother, a little boy, a little girl. And you were looking across the living room, and it was evident from the way the house was furnished that they had everything they needed and then some. And there was a beautiful yellow convertible out in the driveway, and they were standing around a beautiful piece of furniture in the front room, and underneath the picture were these words, Our fondest memory, the day our Magnavox came. You see, friends, if you just have enough things, then you're happy. That's the philosophy of the world today. Have you seen the ad in the magazine about floor covering? Picture of a beautiful den, and you can see across the house and the floor, and it just glistens. It doesn't look if it's as if it's been walked on. Probably wasn't, of course, when the picture was taken. And you can see this beautiful home, and underneath, they're trying to sell floor covering, of course. Underneath is this caption, For a happy home, lay linoleum. You see, that's all there is to it. Your wife is running around with somebody else's husband. Lay linoleum. Solve the problem. Junior goes out of the boys from the school and gets a little careless and wrecks a car. Lay linoleum. That takes care of it. It solves the problems. Now, I'm not being facetious, friends. I'm simply trying to illustrate how very real this thing is that we're talking about. The devil would like to have us think that if we just got enough things that we hunger for and crave, that'll satisfy us. There's never been a day when so many things were available. So we have to get a new refrigerator this year because the one we bought last year has a, a sort of a rounded edge on the top. And this year they squared them off, and who would ever want to be found with a refrigerator that's out of date? I think we ought to add a new word to our vocabulary, friends. Disentanglement, because it's a very real prospect in this enlightened and plenteous age that we become so comfortable here that we'll lose our homesickness for that better land. I believe, friends, that that's a part of the devil's scheme. Now, number two of the deceptions the devil's using so successfully in our day to turn aside the allegiance of men and women is a preoccupation with sex. Do you know that, that uh, sex magazines are read every month by two-thirds of the American people? Imagine that. Hollywood has become synonymous with depravity and moral degradation. One of the greatest blights on the American image anywhere around the world is our Hollywood movies that we send overseas. Did you know that, friends? I know because I spent several years living in India, and I can, I can tell you that one of the things that's doing more harm to destroy the good image of America over there is the motion pictures we're sending from Hollywood to be shown to our friends in those foreign countries. Hollywood has almost become synonymous with Sodom and Gomorrah for sin. No longer is it just an eternal triangle. A boy meets girl, and then somebody else comes along and steals one of them away. They're not satisfied with that anymore. It's the depraved and the perverted and the filthy and the unmentionable that are being glorified in those films. And trying to justify it, they say, well, this is what's really going on. This is what life is all about. We're just trying to depict reality. Sure, it's real, friends, but so is sewage. But we don't run it down the middle of the street. It's so easy for us today to become numb to these things. We see them all the time. It's really embarrassing to stand in front of the newsstand anymore. 
You blush to read even the ads in the newspaper. All an author has to do to guarantee himself a bestseller is just write a book so foul that it's banned from the newsstand, and he's in then. Hollywood had a code of censorship that they imposed on themselves, but they voted to rescind it long ago. It's no longer in existence. And do you know why, friends? Because they discovered that Americans will come and watch anything that's produced. And so they've taken off their voluntary censorship program. The depravity and corruption of our day seems to make Sodom and Gomorrah pretty tame. Our dances, our music, our films, our TV programs, our advertising, the whole appeal to the eye today is the appeal of illicit attraction. I believe it's part of the devil's scheme to lead astray the allegiance and the mind and the will of man. And believe me, he's doing a pretty good job of it. I know we live in a society where it seems that everybody's doing it. It doesn't seem so bad because the guy down the street is doing the same thing. You read about it in a book. You read about it in the newspaper. It reminds me of the little boy who was standing on a street corner one day. The traffic was whizzing by and the light was red. But he stepped down off the curb. But a man who was standing nearby grabbed him by the coat and pulled him back and said, Don't go out there, boy. You'll get run over and killed. The little boy said, Well, it looked dangerous, all right, but everybody else was going across. And the man turned to him and said, Listen, boy, don't look at the people. Look at the light. And friends, that's good counsel. God has left us a light, a guidebook. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. And if our feet are anchored securely here, then we're going to know the difference between right and wrong and between that which is acceptable and that which is sin. The ladies are going to know how to dress for the eyes of Jesus. The men are going to know what to read without having a guilty conscience. Oh, I know the standard is a high one, friends. God's standard always is and has been and will be. But He also gives us the power to live by it. Notice this text in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true... Now, you see what this will do to our reading, don't you, friends? And you see what this will do to what we watch on television. Let me keep reading now. Philippians 4, 8. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Some time ago, an editorial from a big popular magazine headlined this statement, Sex moves to prime time on TV. And the whole gist of the editorial was lamenting the fact that finally these sex movies are moving right into the homes of the people. They were no longer down on the street corner at the motion picture theater where the parents could say, No, Junior, you can't go down there. No, they're coming right into the home now where the children can see everything. They were right in the living room where the family altar is supposed to be. That's where they are now. And I say this is a part of the devil's grand strategy to lead astray the minds of men and women. Now, quickly, let's look at number three, and that's the worship of science. Please don't misunderstand me here because I'm not making any brief for ignorance. Some of my best friends are scientists and Christians. And God has given us reasoning minds, and He expects us to use them. But listen, there's a false worship of the intellect today that I think is leading men and women away from the true God. Some time ago, you probably noticed a flurry of articles on the new scientific attempt to create life in a test tube. Scientists feel that they're just on the verge of putting together the life principle in the test tube. You've read about the DNA molecule, of course. And one of the men quoted in that article, one of the keenest minds in America today, made this statement. He said, I no longer find it necessary to believe in God. Oh, I wonder sometimes how God must feel as he looks down and sees puny man toying away in the laboratory with his test tubes and slide rules and other little gadgets, squirting men out into space a few miles and then gloating over his accomplishment. And then when we rise up and say we've discovered a lot about science, we know so much. It's not necessary any longer for us to believe in God. Isn't that something? Listen, the laws of nature are nothing more than the discoveries of the way in which God controls this universe. Really, it's an incredible age. Science has done so much to make life here on this planet pleasant and comfortable. We wouldn't de deny that for a moment. But the things that modern science has brought to our civilization is also astounding in that it is leading people away from God in many instances. And now, this is Joe Cruz saying goodbye for today.
thousands of peace demonstrators have protested the United States support for resistance forces in South America. Some have even given support to communist governments, yet they claim to be loyal Americans. I'll be back in a moment with the amazing facts about truth and treason. Hello, this is Joe Cruz on the Amazing Facts broadcast, facts which affect you. You know, friends, we're living in an age of dishonesty and deceit. Everywhere we turn our eyes, we see the sham and pretense of a morally bankrupt society. The ridiculous posture of modern advertising has done much to destroy man's faith in what is true and, f and false. One announcer blares forth the assuring words, Plymouth is the finest car on the market. There's none better. But then another man flashes onto the television screen immediately with this dogmatic statement, Ford is the greatest automobile available anywhere. Now this is only one aspect of society today that conditions us to disbelieve most of what we actually hear. If we were to go down the street today and knock on the doors of a dozen different churches in our city and ask them what they believe in most any area of Christian doctrine, for example, baptism, or what happens when a man dies, or punishment of the wicked, or the second coming of Christ, millennium, or you name almost any other subject of the Bible, if we were to knock on the doors of a dozen churches in any city and ask, what do you believe? We'd get a dozen different answers. In fact, we'd get a different answer in every place. Now, what is the purpose of doctrine anyway? It's to teach us something about God. That's its only purpose. If that doctrine is not what the Bible teaches, then it's going to teach us something less than the truth about God. Now, does it make any difference what we believe? Let me ask you this. Did it make a difference to Adam and Eve? Of course it did. Is it possible for a man to be sincere and be sincerely wrong in his beliefs? Absolutely. We need to listen to the words of Jesus here. Now listen, this is an amazing statement right from the lips of our Lord. It's found in Mark 7, 7. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now that's it, friends. It's amazing because it doesn't say they're worshiping in vain because they're heathen. It doesn't say they're lost because they're not worshiping. It says they're worshiping Him. That's what it says. But they're worshiping in vain because they put in the place of a thus saith the Lord one of the traditions of men. So does it make a difference what a man believes? Jesus said, Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. Now, the more you ponder that statement, the more amazing it becomes, because these are not heathen people he's talking to. They're not sinners either. This is not a man in the gutter who's lost who is worshiping in vain. It's the man who is worshiping, but who has put in the place of a plain, direct commandment of God, one of the traditions of men. Now, do you see why we're concerned about truth here in this broadcast? The truth as it is in Jesus, because the devil would like to counterfeit Bible truth and have us believe something less than the truth, because the purpose of truth, the very purpose of the doctrine is to lead us to God. If the doctrine we believe does not square with Scripture, then it teaches us something less than the truth about God. Let me illustrate it this way. What we believe about a person influences our relationship to him. If I believe that my country was responsible for starting uh, a war with all the carnage and bloodshed that follows, it would influence my relationship to my country and prevent me from being a loyal American. What happens to the wicked at the end of the world? There, there are some churches where it's taught that when a man's lost, he's going to burn forever and ever and ever without end. There are some churches that teach that he goes through a period of probation, of torment that gets him ready for glory. And there are some who believe that man is going to be burned up and consumed very quickly in that fire. And there are some who believe that he's going into some kind of a never-never land, a spirit world somewhere, and they're not quite sure just what does happen, but at least it's not eternal happiness. Now listen, what I believe about how God is going to deal with the culmination of this sin problem influences my relationship to Him. If I believe God's going to boil and bake and burn men throughout eternity for 30 years of sin on this earth, is it going to influence my relationship to God? Now, don't jump to any conclusions. We're going to deal with this in depth on another broadcast, but I want to illustrate here what we're talking about. 
These are not just pious platitudes, friends. The devil has successfully counterfeited somewhere every single truth in the world today. Every one of them, not one, has escaped his deception. Does it make a, di a difference what we believe? Of course it does. It certainly did to Adam and Eve. They honestly believed the deception that Satan gave them, that they would be wise, that they ate, at least Eve believed that she would become wise by eating that fruit. And it cost them everything. Jesus said there will be those who are worshiping, but worshiping in vain because they put in place of a plain command of God a man-made tradition. I say it makes a great deal of difference what we believe. Now somebody says, well, I can't leave my church. Listen, we're not talking about churches today. We're talking about following God. Don't look at the people. Look at the light. We need to take one more quick glance here at what Jesus said. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now notice verse 22. This is an amazing statement by our Lord. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Ah, notice, miracle workers. In the name of Jesus, don't you see? Now notice Christ's answer in verse 23. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Oh, this is one of the most sobering passages in the Bible, friends, because we're led face to face here with the understanding uh, that we can't escape, and that, it, and, and that is this, that it makes a difference to God what we believe and how we live. It isn't enough to say, yes, I believe, I'm a church member. It's a matter of how we live and what we believe about our God that makes a difference. Many will say, Lord, we've cast out devils, we've done miracles, we've prophesied, and yet they will be lost. It makes a difference what we believe. Anchor your faith firmly to that rock of Scripture. Now we come to point number five, which we started in our broadcast, our last broadcast, and I believe that perhaps this is one of the most effective deceptions that the devil has turned loose in our day. I've called it simply spiritual procrastination, putting off the claim of Jesus on our lives. The Bible asks, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Oh, it's so easy to get so busy we forget to put first things first. Starting for heaven on a tombstone is risky business, friends. And really, is it fair to burn the candle of life for ourselves and then give only the smoke to God? How many people we've talked to that say this? Well, I know that's the truth. I know what I ought to do, and I plan to, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. That reminds me of the story of a young Persian prince. He decided when he came of age that he was going to spend the next ten years of his life getting an education. Then he was going to spend ten years making money, and then ten years in travel. The last ten years of his life he was going to spend getting right with God and getting things ready for eternity. There was only one thing that happened to mar his plan. He died during the first ten years. Now, we're not calamity howlers, friends, but I'm saying this. The devil would like to have us postpone the day of making our peace with God. Everybody has said it at one time or another. Well, I see when things start shaping up. When I get along in life and see the times beginning to fulfill that Christ is coming, then I'm really going to get down to get ready to meet the Lord, and, and I'll do something about my Christian life. Do you know who suggested such a thing, friends? I'll tell you who did it. I believe that unconcern and spiritual unconcern is one of the greatest curses of our day, and I can tell you that's the devil's doctrine altogether. So many go through life as though there were no God, no heaven, no hell, no tomorrow. You remember Paul and Felix were visiting together, and Felix said, Go thy way for this time, Paul. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. And as far as we know, he never did. You see, heaven is trying to take out of this world a generation of men and women alive. We talked the other day about some of the conditions that existed in our world and how God must feel as He looks down on this whole sordid mess today. How anxious Jesus must be as He sees a place that He's prepared and sees us rather unconcerned about going there. Some time ago, one of the items of interest in the newspaper was about a cave-in and a mine 
in Pennsylvania, I believe it was. There were some miners trapped, but there was reason to believe they were still alive underground. There was no way to dig down through the mine shaft that had caved in, so they were hoping the miners were off to the side of the main shaft in a little room and a horizontal shaft. So they brought in a great drilling rig and started drilling down through that virtually solid rock, trying to get into that room where they felt they were probably entombed. Hour after hour, day after day, while the world watched virtually holding its breath, as the news media portrayed for us the picture of how they went down there six inches, then another foot, and then finally three feet. The families camped at the mouth of that mine where the rescue operations were going on. And then finally the day came when that great boring rig bore through the ceiling of that room where the cameras were trapped. Rapidly it was withdrawn, and they lowered a microphone to a little speaker down that hole. The man who was directing the rescue operation at the top spoke into the microphone. He said, Are you all right? Are you alive? Are you there? And then a voice came back from the heart of the earth. Yes, we're here. We're all right. And a great shout went up from the rescue workers at the opening of that pit. Then the director said this on the microphone, What do you want the most? And there was a pause, and then a voice came back, I want a cigar. Oh, friends, heaven is involved in the greatest rescue operation the world has ever known. All the universe is watching. Day after day, week after week, year after year, for the last 6,000 horrible years, God has been seeking to rescue those of us who have been entombed by this avalanche of sin. And what must it do to His heart by our procrastination, our lethargy, our spiritual postponement of eternal things, and then we send back a message and say, Oh, we're satisfied with the trinkets. We're satisfied with these little things. Oh, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? J. A. Kennedy of Birmingham, England, wrote these words, and I want you to listen to them carefully. When Jesus came to Golgotha, they hanged Him on a tree. They drove great nails through His hands and made a calvary. They crowned Him with a crown of thorns. Red were His wounds and deep. For those were cruel, crude and cruel days, and human flesh was cheap. When Jesus came to Birmingham, they only passed Him by. They never hurt a hair of Him. They only let Him die. For men had grown more tender, and they would not give Him pain. And so they passed on down the street and left Him in the rain. Still Jesus cried, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And still it rained a winter rain that drenched Him through and through. The crowds went home and left the streets without a soul to see. And Jesus leaned against the wall and cried for Calvary. Friends, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Have you been guilty of neglecting the Savior who loves you and died for you? It's so easy in this materialistic age to leave Him standing outside the heart's door. A hundred matters clamor for the first attention of our hearts. Oh, this is an hour for Christians to be very selective and cautious in the matter of how we spend our time and how we spend our money. Let me urge you to take more time to read the great guidebook of heaven. And now this is Joe Cruz saying goodbye for today. 